So the title of the sermon this, uh, this evening is The Vessels Are Holy. The Vessels Are Holy. And of course, I get that there in Ezra chapter 8. And you're going to want to bookmark something in Ezra 8 before we get started here because we'll be back and forth a little bit. But it says there in Ezra 8 chapter, uh, chapter 8 verse, uh, well, let's just jump down to verse 26. He said, I even weighed under their hand 650 talents of silver and silver vessels and 100 talents and of gold and 100 talents. Also, 20 basins of gold of a thousand drams and of two vessels of fine copper, precious as gold. So here Ezra is just giving the, these, these priests all of this just very valuable substance. And he says unto them in, very t in verse 28, And I said to them, Ye are holy unto the Lord, the vessels are holy also. And that's where I get the title, The Vessels Are Holy. And what I want to preach about in particular tonight is the idea that taking responsibility for your uh, the taking responsibility for your sanctification it is the personal responsibility of every christian to to make sure that they are walking with the lord that they are living a holy life a pure life a clean life that is your responsibility as a believer now i will say of course we all understand that when we are saved we are uh, we are sanctified we are set apart unto the lord our god through salvation but the sanctification I'm talking about tonight is, a, is the process uh, by which a Christian then goes on to live a, a, a life for the Lord. And in that process, you know, they become, hopefully, they are living a holier and godlier life as they go along. So right out of the gate, let's just talk about that word sanctified. You know, to be holy is to be set apart or sanctified. That's what it means to be holy, to be set apart unto something or to be sanctified. These are words that are often used uh, interchangeably. And if you want, go over to, again, keep something in Ezra 8, but go over to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. I'm just going to read to you some verses tonight to help you understand what this word holy and sanctified means. It says in Psalm 4, But know that the Lord hath set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. So that which is set apart unto the Lord is, is that which is sanctified. And what is it that God sets apart unto himself? That, that which is godly. God sets apart him that is godly for himself. He sanctifies them because they are holy. It says in Exodus 13, And thou shalt set apart unto the Lord all that openeth the matrix, and every firstling that cometh of a beast, which thou hast, all the males shall be the Lord. So he, you know, that's a commandment there concerning the sacrifices. And those sacrifices were considered holy unto the Lord. They were to be given to him. They were sanctified. They were holy. They were set apart, it says there. The Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 14, Ye are the children of the Lord your God. Ye shall not cut yourselves, nor make any baldness between your eyes for the dead. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. And the Lord hath chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself above all nations that are upon the earth. So he's saying there, you know, look, you're different than the other nations. You are above all the nations that are upon the earth. You're different. You're sanctified. You're set apart. You're holy people unto the Lord. He hath chosen thee to be peculiar to be different, to be set apart, to be sanctified, to be holy. Exodus chapter 3, and, and he said, uh, of course, this is the Lord appearing to Moses in the burning bush and, bush, and he said to him, Draw not nigh thither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. It was sanctified ground. It was not like all the other ground because the presence of the Lord was there. And he said, if you're going to come near unto me, you're going to take the shoes, your shoes off your feet because I am holy and therefore be ye holy. Is what the Bible teaches us. So we see throughout Scripture that when God sets something apart, when God makes something peculiar, God sanctifies it. That's what it means to be sanctified, to be set apart unto something. You're there in 1 John. Look at 1, uh, chapter 5, 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. It says there, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. So let me. what, what is it about the Holy Ghost that makes him holy? Is it, is it because he's the only ghost? No, it's because he is, God, he's the, it, he is God. He is holy. There's nobody else like him. He is peculiar. He is set apart. He's not the only ghost. He's not the only spirit that is in the world. right? But he is the Holy Ghost because he is God. He is sanctified. He is set apart. You see how that works there. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We're going to look at a few passages here in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. So right out of the gate, we just got to understand what does it mean to be holy? What does it mean to be sanctified? The title of the sermon is Taking Responsibility for Your Sanctification. The vessels are holy. Okay? 
1 Corinthians chapter 7, look at verse 13. And he said, The woman which hath an husband and, and be, that believeth not, if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now they are holy. And I'm just turning us to that passage to show us that the words sanctified and holy are used interchangeably. I'm not really going to try and take that, that, that passage apart, but just showing us there, he's saying, look, the husband that is unbelieving is sanctified by the believing wife. The unbelieving wife is sanctified by the, by the believing husband. Otherwise, your children are unclean, but they, now they are holy. They also are sanctified. I believe he just used the word holy there instead of sanctified for sake of not sounding too redundant. They are sanctified, they are holy. These words mean the same thing. Being sanctified is being made holy. That's what it means tonight. And I want to lay that groundwork because, again, what I'm trying to get across tonight is the fact that every single one of us has to take personal responsibility for our own sanctification. <clears throat> Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 4, For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refu refused. Amen? That should be, that's some of our life's verse, right? Every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. It's sanctified. It's set apart. It's made holy. It's acceptable. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Know ye not the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And of such were some of you, but ye are washed. What is he saying here? You used to be these things, some of you, but now you're washed. You're set apart. You've been cleaned. But ye are sanctified, ye are justified in the name of our Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So we see here that to be sanctified, it means to be set apart. It means to be holy. And it's our responsibility tonight, every single one of us, to take that responsibility upon ourselves. Yes, we're sanctified when we're saved unto salvation. But as far as what kind of a life we're going to live, if we're going to walk in holiness and godliness, or are we going to walk in the lusts of the flesh, that is up to us. That's not something that's just going to happen automatically. You're not just going to wake up one morning and all of a sudden be this godly individual without purposing in it to do so in your heart. <clears throat> now we're going to look at Ezra chapter 8 here. I'm going to make applications. You see here in Ezra chapter 8 that both the vessels and the priests were what? They were holy. They were sanctified. They were set apart. You see, you look there in verse 24. He said, Then I separated 12 of the chief priests, Sherebiah, Hashabiah, and 10 of the brethren with them. Okay, jump down to 28. And I said unto them, Ye are holy unto the Lord. The vessels also are holy. Now who's priest today? What are we today? Are, we are priests today. We do not have a Levitical priesthood. But the Bible is very clear that just as in Ezra's day, the priests were what? They were sanctified. They were set apart. They were holy. And I'm here to tell you this night that we today in the New Testament, we are priests. And, we've, and we're being told the same thing. Look, we need to be set apart. We need to be holy. We need to be sanctified. Go over to Revelation. Keep something in Ezra chapter 8 all night tonight, but go over to Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5, I'll read to you from Revelation 1. It says, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father. God, Jesus Christ, through his blood, when you got saved, you were made a king and a priest Amen. unto our God. Amen. And I'm here to tell you that tonight, as a king, as a priest, you are to be set apart. You are to be sanctified. You are to be holy Amen. in your living. Look at Revelation chapter 5. Look at verse 9. And they sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to, uh, to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Look, God has set us apart into a very special place. God has given us a very special position in the kingdom of heaven as kings and priests, as those that are going to rule and reign with Christ. And that's why today it is our personal responsibility to take, it is our job, rather, to take personal responsibility for our sanctification. 
to live a separated life as Christians. <clears throat> if you would, go back to, or go to Romans chapter 9, Romans chapter 9. The Bible says in Reve Revelation 20, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. He's blessed and he's holy. He's sanctified. He's set apart from the other resurrection, the second one, right? On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. We've been sanctified. We've been set apart. We've been made holy. And it's something that's very special. And that came at a great price. We just read it all that we would, we were sanctified. We were set apart. We've been redeemed by uh, to to God by the blood, by Thy blood. It's the blood of Christ that has bought us, that has redeemed us. Amen. New Testament believers today, they are priests. But not only that, New Testament believers today, they're also in Ezra eight. They are the vessels. Men in general are likened unto vessels in the Bible. If you're going to Romans chapter nine, I'll read to you from Second Corinthians four. It says. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. He's talking about our body. Our body is that earthen vessel that we have that treasure in, that light that has shined in our hearts, the knowledge of the glory of, the, uh, in the, in, of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's a treasure that we have in what? In an earthen vessel. That the excellency of power may be of God, not of us. Look at Romans chapter 9. Tonight, we are priests unto our God. We're sanctified. We're set apart. But we are also the vessels of God. Look at Romans chapter 9. He said in verse 17, For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for the same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Thou wilt say unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing form say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay, the same lump to make one vessel unto honor, and unto another, and, 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 and another unto dishonor? So again, he's likening men like Pharaoh in, unto a vessel. Okay? Look at verse 22. What if God willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, that he might make the and, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy. We are those vessels of mercy, which he hath before afore prepared unto glory. So again, we are not only priests tonight, sanctified and set apart on that, but we are also sanctified and set apart as vessels of God, okay? Now, here's the thing about being a vessel. Go over to 2 Timothy chapter 2, okay? Not all vessels are kept holy. God can sanctify a vessel. God's Holy Spirit, God, somebody can get saved. God can move into that person and seal them unto day of redemption by the power of His Spirit through faith in Christ. And they are sanctified. They are set apart unto Him. They are a vessel of mercy but that, that, that doesn't mean that vessel is going to stay clean the whole time. That doesn't mean that while we're walking this earth, we can't start pouring things into this vessel that ought not to be there. We can defile the vessel of God on this earth. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Study to show thyself to prove unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But, shan, uh, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And the word will eat as doth a canker of who is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying the resurrection is already past, and overfloweth the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. We need to depart from iniquity if we name the name of Christ. We should be trying to get these things out. Look at verse 20. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Like you say, in a great house, there's all kinds of different vessels. There's some that are used, you know, for some very good purposes, for very special purposes. You know, we think about maybe some vessels we might have around the house. You know, we got our great grandmother's china in the cabinet, and we take it out every, you know, maybe once a year, maybe never, <laughs> maybe just to dust it. Right? But it's special. It's a vessel. It's, it's a vessel of honor. Right? Now, I'm not going to try to think of too many examples, but I'm sure there's some vessels around our house that are vessels of dishonor. 
right? I remember when I was growing up, we had the compost bucket. Who knows what that is, right? Mm -hmm. And that was, you know, we kept a compost pile back for, for making gardening soil. And what you threw in the compost bucket was a bunch of, you know, refuse. You threw the broken eggshells, you threw the banana peels, the, you know, the orange peels, just whatever, you know, stuff that's just going to break down and rot and decay. Look, that, that old ice cream bucket that we used for all that, that scrap to go in the compost pile, that was not a vessel of honor. That we were not going to empty that out, wash it out, and set it next to grandma's, you know, gravy, gravy bowl or whatever, the what boat, I guess they call it, right? Say, what a lovely piece of china, but what's that plas plastic Tupperware? Well, that's our compost bucket. <laughs> you know, it was my grandfather's, and it was, you know, his grandfather's before him, and it's been passed down generation <laughs> to generation, and, you know, we take it down and we use it for compost. No, it's a vessel of dishonor. You know, if it fell and got a hole in it, you know, we didn't try to repair it. We threw it out and got another one. You know, I think about all the other vessels of uh, dishonor in my mom's house. She was one that, you know, anything that was plastic and had a lid on it immediately got saved. You know, they, you know, she had the two bot like a row of cupboards in the bottom that was just, I don't know if anybody's mother or else's mother was like this, but it was just, you know, anything you could pull out to just store food in. She had all kinds of Tupperware. You know, but those weren't, she might have said those are vessels of honor, but when we had it, we, we gave her grief about it, say, Mom, those are vessels of dishonor. You don't need all this stuff, right? But look, he's saying here, look, in, some, in houses, there's vessels of honor and there's vessels of dishonor. The question is tonight, which one are you? What are you putting in your vessel? You know, are you, are you that vessel that's taken down and treated very nicely? And, you know, we put all nice things at it and we have a nice meal and we eat off of it and we're, we feel safe eating off of it because it's clean, because it's sanctified, right? Or are you that compost bucket? You know, if I came, you come over to my house and I just, you know, just re rinsed out the compost bucket real quick and put some slop in it and said, here you go, let's eat. Are you going to belly up to that? Probably not. But God looks down on his people sometimes and that's what he sees. He sees this vessel that he sanctified, that he set apart, and we're just pouring in all kinds of trash. You know, whether it's you know, through our mouth or through our eyes or through our mind or through our whatever, through our ears, through the music, the smut, the drugs, the alcohol, whatever it might be. What, what kind of vessel are we tonight? And I'm here to tell you again that your sanctifi sanctification is your personal responsibility. <coughs> he said, if a man, in verse 21, purge therefore himself of these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. Say, so I want God to use me. I want God to use me to do a good work. Well, are you prepared? Are you sanctified? Have you purged yourself from these things? Because God's not going to use a dirty vessel to do a holy work. He says, you say, well, what kind of things should I purge? Well, everything we just kind of read, that ties in there, right? Uh, shun the profane and vain babblings, for one. But he also says there in verse 22, flee also youthful lusts. You want to purge yourself? Flee youthful lusts. And follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace. Like the righteousness, the, fair, the faith, the charity, the peace. That's like you taking that dirty vessel and just, you know, you, you go over to the sink and you run the hot water. That's your faith. Then you get the Dawn dish soap out, right? There you put some charity in there. You get, this, you get, the, get the peace, you know, the, the rubber gloves on. You get some peace. And then you're in there scrubbing, you know? You need to be, that's what you have to do if you want to be a vessel unto honor, a vessel that is prepared unto every good work, a vessel that is sanctified and meet for the master's use. <coughs> you say, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a pretty clean vessel. I've only got a little bit of sin in my life. Well, why don't, me, why don't I pour you a nice, cool glass of water, and then I'll go in the bathroom over here, and I'll take a little eyedropper, and I'll just suck a little toilet water out of it. And then I'll walk, and I'll, I'll walk over and hand you your little, nice, cool, refreshing cup of water, clean and pure, and I'll put one little drop, just one little drop. That's all. And it's, it's, it's been flushed. And I'm not talking about the raw, nasty stuff. I'm saying a flush toilet. And just put one little, just a, just a little, just a little drop. Just a smidge, just a little, you know. And say, here you go. Would you drink that? You say, no way, man. You throw it in my face. <laughs> Don't do that. That'd be mean. <laughs> but then we're going to say, well, God's going to use me. God's going to use me because, you know, what? I only have a little sin. 
And look, I know none of us is perfect, and I know we're all going to have some sin in our life, but we have to always be in this process of what? Purging it, of getting it out. When God says, hey, when God puts his finger on something and says, I want this out of your life, get it out. When God convicts us and says, this ought not to be in your life, get this out of your vessel. And you know what? Sometimes we start out later in life and we find out, we start to look inside and the vessel's pretty dirty. The thoughts, the things we say, the things we do. And sometimes we have to spend some time and they're really scrubbing and working to clean that vessel up. You know, and if we're in the process of doing that, you know, God's going to use us. God's going to help us. But you know, if we get, we just feel like we got ourselves so cleaned up and we got everything right, but we just have this one little corner, you know, like some of those, you ever wash dishes by hand? My mom had, we always begged my mom for a dishwasher. She said, I got three. <laughs> <laughs> right? But you ever know when you wash dishes by hand? This is probably a, a foreign concept to some, right? You have to actually scrub. You, sometimes you'd have that one dish. It's just like you had to like take the washcloth and really put your finger in there and just get in there. You know, we can't have these crusty little moldy spots in our vessel that we're not going to do anything about and just say, well, God's okay with that. I mean, after all, look at how clean the rest of it is. Well, look how, look how clean the rest of the water is. It's just one little drop of toilet water. What's your problem? Drink up. <coughs> we need to purge these things from our life to be a, a, a vessel fit under the master's use. We need to purge the sin. We need to pur purge you know, from the false teachers, the Hymenaeus and Philenuses of the world. He said in verse 19, Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Flee also youthful lusts. I'll tell you, verse 22 was an instrumental verse in my early Christian life. When I first got saved, I really hadn't you know, locked some things down. As, you know, I was King James. I, I got that figured out real quick. But I really wasn't sure about what type of church to go to. And I was kind of you know, in a different, tough spot in life. And I kind of was go, and I ended up going to this uh, this Christian youth group. That's kind of where I started out. It was, but it was a very ecumenical. I mean, I found out later people. I mean, they had people from the Assemblies of God, they had people from the Community Church, they had Baptists there. It was just like this really big ecumenical youth prayer group that met every week at somebody's house. And I remember, you just it's it, the Holy Spirit slowly started to teach me, like you know, you can't just have fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. There's, you know, that you have to draw a hard line when it comes to doctrine and tw verse 22 was one he really used in my heart to flee youthful lust and to follow righteousness faith charity peace with them that call on the lord out of a pure heart and i said you know what i need to, i want to be a, a, a vessel that god can use i need to get away from this false doctrine i need to get away from the hymenaeuses the Philetuses, whose word doth eat like a canker, and I need to get in an IFB church. Independent, where somebody, and you say, well, is it the name on the door that makes them right? No, it's the book that they preach and how they preach it. That's why I purged myself from them and flew, you know, flew, uh, I, I, I fleed from youthful lust and followed righteousness and faith and charity and peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So you see tonight, you know, there, we are likened unto priests, but we're also likened unto vessels. And it's the priests, you know, you and I, who are responsible to keep the vessels, our, you know, also ourselves, as they journeyed from Babylon to Jerusalem. Okay, so if you remember in Ezra, go back there, you know, he's giving the priests, right, which is also a picture of us in a way, but he gave them these vessels. And he said, take these vessels and go to Jerusalem and bring them into the house of God. And that's kind of like what we're doing today. You know, we're these priests and we have these vessels. We're priests unto God. That's coming. We're going to be priests. We're already made priests. We're already made kings. But God has given us these vessels. And we have to journey from Babylon to Jerusalem. Okay, do you see where I'm going here with this? <clears throat> And he says in Ezra chapter 8, look at verse 28, And I said unto them, Ye are holy in the Lord, and the vessels also are holy, are holy also, and the silver and the gold are a freewill offering of the Lord, a God of our fathers. Watch ye and keep them. So he says, look, you need to watch these vessels. You need to not lose track of them. You need to keep them. And that's what we need to do today as Christians, as God's priests who have been given these vessels that are our bodies. We need to watch them. Look when they're old. This vessel is getting dirty. Time to clean it up. 
Oh, look, there's someone trying to pour this in my vessel. That's not going to happen. I'm going to flee from that. We need to keep it clean. We need to keep them. Okay? Just as the priests were to watch and keep the vessels, so we as priests are to watch and keep our vessels. <coughs> Bible says in 1 Thessalonians, I'll just read to you. It says, Furthermore, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus Christ, that as you have received of us, how you ought to walk to please God. You know there's a way how to walk to please God? There's a way how to walk to please God. So uh, how do you know you please God? Well, because... Because I'm saved. Look, I'm glad you're saved, but that's not, that's not enough to please God. You ought to walk to please God. There's a way you have to live your life to be pleasing to God. You have to watch the vessel. You've got to keep it clean so that you would abound more and more for you know the commandments which were given you by the Lord Jesus. Look, there's commandments that are given us that we have to obey, that we have to walk in if we want to please God. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. You know, that's one big one. That's the one way to really make your vessel dirty in a hurry is fornication. I mean, you can permanently mar that vessel. And you go out and get contract some STD. And even if you didn't, you say, well, I got away with it. You know, we did it safely if there is such a thing. You still, you've still marred your vessel before God. God still says you're unclean. So that's one ex example. You should abstain from fornication that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. You know, we ought to walk to please God. And how do you do that? By keeping the vessel, by watching it, by possessing it in sanctification and honor, by not just treating it like some carnal playground for us to just do whatever we want with it, to put whatever we want into it, to look at whatever we want, to listen to whatever we want. You know, sometimes we, I think we just need to stop sometimes and say, is what I'm about to do or say or look at or listen to or even sometimes eat, is this even please, would this please God? And sometimes I think if we would do that, we would probably say, nope. Yeah. This, God would rather me not do this. And the more conscientious we are about that and the more we walk with that type of thinking, you know what's going to happen? The cleaner and cleaner and cleaner your life is going to become. And what's going to happen after, as that happens is the more God is going to use you. The more you're set apart unto God, the more you sanctify your vessel, the more God is going to use you. The more God's going to look down and say, look, he keeps set, this person keeps setting themselves apart. He's more and more meat for the master's use. <coughs> he goes on here and he says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 5, he says to, uh, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. I mean, Paul is just, you know, this is some hard preaching. <laughs> He's getting after him about the, the fornication and, and everything else and, and, and defrauding their brethren. And he's saying, look, we have forewarned you. There's other preaching that Paul did that we don't even know about. He's saying, look, we forewarned you. You know what commandments we taught you by the Lord Jesus Christ. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. That is the Christian life. Is to live a life of holiness. And if you despise that call, if you hear preaching like this and say, I disagree, I don't like what you're saying. What do you mean I can't commit fornication? What do you mean I can't just do whatever I want? What do you mean I can't, if it feels good, do it? That's what the world will tell you. That's what the Gentiles, which know not God, will tell you and live a dirty life. And if we despise that, you know who you're despising? You're not despising me. I'm just the messenger. And people get mad at the preacher all the time. Oh, I can't believe he'd say that. What do you mean I ought to dress a certain way or keep, you know, I should live my life like this or my role is that and my role is this. I can't do this. I can't do that. You fuddy duddies, you just want to ruin all my fun. You can go ahead and get mad at the preacher all you want, but you despise God, is what he's saying here. It says in verse 8, He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God. That's who you're mad at tonight. You know, I'm just an easy target. Because <laughs> I'm slow and big. <laughs> 
all right? <laughs> I'm the easy target because I'm here. You can see me. You can get to me. And uh, you know what? I'm a lot, much less intimidating target than God is. So it's easy to just throw it at the preacher and just say, well, that preacher down there at that church with their Bible talking about how they sh we shouldn't do this and I can go to the casino if I want. It's all right if I get drunk, sleep around, and do whatever. Who does he think he is? I think I'm nobody. Who is sufficient for these things? But our sufficiency is of Christ. It's not me. You know your problem's with? The one who wrote this book right here. Because that's all I'm preaching. He that despiseth, uh, despiseth not man, but God, who hath given unto us his Holy Spirit. The, one, the Christian who would despise this, and they're out there, Oh, they're out there today. We're not under the law, man. We're under grace. You got to get free, bro. Right? That whole thing. There's no, therefore, no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. And then they forget the rest of the verse. Right? Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Meaning, if you walk after the flesh, there is condemnation. God will judge His children. And they're out there, they despise this type of preaching. They don't want to be told they can't do anything. They want to just say, hey, I can sin and it's okay. God's fine. It's all under the blood. But you know what? Who you're despising? You're despising God, who has given you that Holy Spirit, who has sanctified you and set you apart. It'd be like if I came to you or somebody, anybody came to you and gave you this beautiful vase or whatever, gave you some beautiful vessel Maybe just a nice set of, you know, uh, ceramic plate. Well, I don't know what these, a plate, a bowl. <laughs> I don't know. A nice decorative bowl, right? Who, I mean, people probably have their favorite bowls, right? Now, let me just say, when I got married, the one thing I, that we went, this is just a side story because it's coming to mind and we all like stories, right? When we went to Bed Bath & Beyond to register for all of our gifts, the one thing, I think it was the one thing, right, was plastic bowls. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I want a set of plastic bowls, right? Not exactly the most ornate thing. But what if someone got you for your bridal shower or your wedding gift, this beautiful ceramic bowl, and then you later had that person over, and they look over and you're feeding your dog out of it. <laughs> you know, you're just putting Alpo in it <laughs> and feeding Fido. And they go, what are you doing? I, Man, that thing cost me like 80 bucks or whatever, you know? some beautiful dish that they give you as a gift. You're like, oh, thanks. And you just take it over and you know, use it for a litter box or something. Or whatever. You defile it. You don't use it for the intended purpose. Well, you're just like that guy. It would be just like this person here who's been given the Holy Spirit and then despises the one that gave, him to, gave it him that Holy Spirit and just treats the vessel however he wants. Because we're sanctified. We're set apart by the Holy Spirit. And we're sealed in the day of the redemption. You know, God has, has wants us to be a vessel meet for the master's use. And here's the thing. You're redeemed. You're not your own. You are bought with the price as the precious blood of a lamb, as, as the blood of Christ, the Bible says. God redeemed you. You're not your own. His, that's, that's his vessel that you're walking around in now. That's his. He bought it. It's his vessel. And how are you going to treat it? You're going to take that dish and just feed the dog with it? Or are you going to set it apart? Are you going to make, make special use out of it? And people get mad and they get upset about this type of preaching and say, well, I'm just not going to change. Yeah, yeah, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Well, just be careful you're not despising God. <coughs> you know, Ezra was just a preacher, right? Ezra was just a preacher. He's just saying to the priest, hey, here's the vessels. Make sure you watch them and keep them. He's just a preacher. And people despise the preacher for what he preaches, but in reality, they despise God and his word. What did Paul say in Galatians? Am I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? And what I'm getting at tonight is that sancti your sanctification is your responsibility, not mine. I'm just getting up and preaching it. I'm just telling you that God condemns fornication, that God condemns adultery, that God condemns drunkenness, that God doesn't want us looking at smut, that God doesn't want us talking filthy. That God doesn't want us just filling this vessel with garbage. He wants us to watch and keep the vessel as we take it from this world to the next. As we go from Babylon to Jerusalem. I'm just the preacher. I'm just Ezra tonight. So you can get mad at me, but I'm just giving you the instructions. 
Am I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Is that, that's what Paul said. Take responsibility for your sanctification because it's yours. It's not mine. I'm just delivering the message. Because one day you will give an account for what you did in this life. One day we will all give an account for how we use this vessel for God. And we can get mad and we can storm out of here, maybe now or you know, <laughs> maybe later, maybe somewhere down the road the preacher gets on something or has to come to you and point something out and say, hey, I'm just telling you, this is what the Bible says, this is what you're doing, you might want to consider this. And we can get stiff-necked and, you know, and cold-hearted and hard-hearted and just go off in a huff and just say, well, I'm just going to do whatever I want. But you know what? At the end of your life, you're still going to give an account to God. You might not have to come to church and give an account to me anymore or to the church, but at the end of your life, you're still going to give an account to God. You know, those priests could have just taken those vessels from Ezra and just gotten a few paces and just threw them off the side and just went their own way. And, well, you know, those things were heavy. I didn't want to lug them around. I mean, copper, silver, gold, those are heavy metals. I don't want to lug that stuff around. We'll just get to Jerusalem and we'll figure it out then. And they get there and the high priest is there going, where's the vessels? What'd you do with them? What do you mean you just tossed them aside? Well, you know, I just felt like doing whatever I want. Fail. <laughs> Epic fail. He's not going to be happy. Look at Ezra chapter 8, verse 29. He said, Watch ye and keep them until ye weigh them before the chief of the priests and the Levites and the chief of the fathers of Israel at Jerusalem, at Jerusalem in the chambers of the Lord. See, the priests that were bearing that vessel to Jerusalem would report to the chief priest. And who's the chief priest in our life? Jesus Christ. The Bible says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Jesus Christ. Just like those priests back then had a high priest over them, we as God's priests today also have a high priest over us. And he's gonna, we're going to give an account to him for what we did with those vessels. How did they make it to the other side? Did you watch and keep them? Or did, oh, here's your vessel, high priest, but I drug it through the mud the entire way there. I didn't bother to keep it in a nice sack. I didn't keep it safe out of the dirt. I didn't take it out and wash it. I just treated it however I wanted. But here you go. It's here. Oh, gee, thanks for this marred, beat-up, worthless vessel that you drug through the mud. <clears throat> you know, we're going to give an account one day for how we treated this vessel to the, the high priest. <clears throat> in the Ezra's day, the chief priests were waiting at Jerusalem. That's where they were. He said there, Watch ye and keep them until ye weigh them before the chief of the priests and the Levites and the chief of the fathers at Jerusalem. And what are we, where are we going today? We're not going to a physical Jerusalem, but we're, we're, we're going to leave this world, Babylon. We're on our way out. We're, we're just passing through here. And one day we're going to go to where the chief priest is. And where is he today? He's in the new Jerusalem. Seeing in that you have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. <clears throat> and when they reached Jerusalem, they would weigh the vessels. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We'll end there. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. When, we reached, when they reached Jerusalem, they would do what? They would weigh the vessels before the chief priest. They would give an account They'd say, did you bring everything Ezra gave you? Yep, all right, put it on a scale. Let's see it's all here. Let's see if you didn't try to keep some of it for yourself to do what you wanted to do with it. Spend it how you want to spend it. All this precious metal that he gave you. And when we reach Jerusalem in the heavens, the new Jerusalem, and we stand before our high priest, you know what? We're going to put some things on the scale too. He's going to weigh things out. He's going to put our life in the balances and see what we did with our vessels that he gave us in this life. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, look at verse 9, For ye are labors together with God, ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me, as a wise master builded, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. Look, Paul the preacher, he's just saying, look, I just laid the foundation. I'm just telling you this is how it is. Just like Ezra, hey, you got, you got to take these vessels and go there. And that's all I'm doing tonight. I'm just telling you, your vessel, 
that you're a priest that's responsible for your vessel, that your sanctification is your responsibility, and you're going to give an account to God for what you did in this life, not me. God's not going to take me aside as long as I did my job as a preacher. He's not going to take me aside and say, well, what about so-and-so? That's, that's your problem. <laughs> Sorry, Lord. That, that's, you know, he's not going to pull me aside and grill me over how you lived your life. <clears throat> your, your sanctification is your responsibility. He said, let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. And I can get up here and tell you things till I'm blue in the face about what you need to do to live for God. And it's up to you to do it or not. True. But you know what? You're the one that's going to suffer the consequences, not me. Because we're all going to stand before God and give an account. You know, and I'm going to give an account. <laughs> As, you know, be that therefore many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. You know, if I fail to get up and tell you what needs to be said, I'm going to give an account for that. You know, I'm not, I'm not exempt from this. <clears throat> he says here in verse 11, For other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. Now, I don't think the wood, hay, stubble there is talking about sin. The wood, hay, stubble is just the stuff that we all have to do in life that's, that's really of no eternal value. I mean, there's things we do in this life that have no eternal value, but they're things we have to do. You know, we have to change the oil on the car. That's a work that we did, or should do. <laughs> you know, we all got to go take the water jugs, right, and fill them up, and down to the water store, unless you're one of these people that are drinking from the tap. You know, which I think you can get away with in Tucson because I don't think there's any fluoride here. Don't quote me on that. <laughs> I could be wrong. But look, we all have things that we just got to do in this life. That's the wood, hay, stubble. And look, I'm, great. I'm, I'm glad that we're taking care of the wood, hay, and stubble. But are you taking care of the gold, silver, and precious, sto uh, precious stones as well? Are you going to have anything when you stand before God? Would you repeat, report to the high priest with your vessel in the New Jerusalem? And he says, give an account. Let's see what you got. Is it just all going to be wood, hay, and stubble? And then you're going to see brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so just go by with just a big cart full of gold and silver and precious stones. And say, oh, that's not fair. Well, you could have had some if you wanted some. It's all there for the taking. You could lay up treasures in heaven if you wanted to. He said, look, every man's work shall be made manifest, verse 13, for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Look, the foundation's been laid for all of us. We all have the same foundation. It's up to you how you want to build on it. What do you want to spend your life doing? What do you want to do with the vessels God has given you? What do you want to do with that vessel? Just entertainment, just mindless entertainment, just worthless passing of the time. Just maybe just doing wood, just doing hay, just doing stubble? Or do you want to get some gold? Do you want to get some silver? Do you want to get some precious stones? Some souls out there? That's what I want. If any man's work be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet also so bad as by fire. Look, is that, is that what you want your Christian life to culminate as? I squeaked by. Well, I'm in heaven. Look, I know the Bible says be, he would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of his God. But you don't have to settle for doorkeeper. You know, you can be over 10 cities. You can shine as, as the sun. And he ends with this in verse 16. In light of everything that we just read about how it's up to us to build upon the foundation, how our works are going to be tried. Then he ends in verse 16. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. What's he bringing it all back to that vessel again? Look, you're a vessel unto God. You're the temple. He says in verse 17, If any man defile the temple of God, temple of God him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Look, you're that priest, you're that vessel, you're the temple of God tonight. And we can't just have this attitude of, well, I can just do whatever I want with this vessel. I can treat God's temple which temple I am, however I want. Because the Bible says God will destroy that person. God's not just going to let us treat it however we want. 
You know, we could suffer lots. And then it can get to the point where a Christian just gets so backslidden and so out of the will of God that God just takes them home. I heard it put this way. God brings some of his children home and crowns them. Other children, he crowns them and takes them home. Right? Which crown do you want? I want the crown that he gives in heaven. So we, the people and the preacher, like Ezra and the priests, are laborers together. Look, we're all in this together. And you can despise me, but are you really despising me? I'm just, I'm just Ezra tonight, and you're the priests, and I understand we're all priests. But that's the role I'm, I'm playing tonight, Ezra. And I'm just telling you, look, you have a temple. You have a vessel that God has given in your hands. And you need to take this vessel of yours and go to Jerusalem and report to the high priest. That's my job. And I have the same commission. I've been given the same thing. I have a vessel that I have to take there. We're laborers together. So take heed how you build upon the foundation on, on the, of Jesus Christ. And how do you do that? You take heed by not defiling the temple, the vessels of God, which temples you are. And how do you do that? By taking responsibility for your sanctification. Let's go ahead and pray.